tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people or improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we are doing part one of a two-part series of a webinar that we did with the folks at Neighborhood Cats called Mobilizing the Community to Make TNR Happen. And this is part one of that webinar. We really felt it was important to turn these webinars that we do with the team over at Neighborhood Cats into podcasts. So this will be part one called Mobilizing the Community to Make TNR Happen. You can also find the video on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. You can access the handouts from the events. You can just go to communitycatspodcast.com and go on our education page and you'll be able to find that there where our TNR certification workshops where you can register for that. So uh, enjoy mobilizing the community to make TNR happen, part one. We have here, Susie Richmond is the executive director of Neighborhood Cats. Uh, she joined the organization after over 20 years running a major New York City shelter and nonprofit veterinary clinic at Neighborhood Cats. She has led multiple large targeted TNR projects in New York City and Northern New Jersey, managed a program for providing scholarships to veterinarians for training in high volume spay neuter of community cats and co-authored the Humane Society of the United States online course on TNR. In her spare time, she could often be found trapping feral cats on Maui. And then we now have Brian Cordes, who is the co-founder and national programs director for Neighborhood Cats, a leading community cat advocacy group with hands-on programs in New York City, New Jersey, and Maui. Currently, he and his wife, Susie Richmond, live in Hawaii and can usually be found trapping cats or releasing them after they've been neutered. In between stints with Neighborhood Cats, he served as a grants manager for PetSmart Charities, overseeing over $21 million in TNR and spay neuter projects. He has produced many of the leading educational materials on trap neuter return, including award-winning books and videos, has assisted numerous communities in setting up large-scale TNR programs, and is a frequent presenter on community cat issues. Brian has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Okay. Thank you so much, Stacey. Appreciate the intro. And thank you, everybody, for spending some time with us today. Today, we're going to talk about how to get your community more involved in uh, TNR. And this today is the first part of a three-part series that that's new that we're partnering with the Community Cats podcast on this year. And it's about what we call community TNR. And that's as compared to, we do a lot of webinars. We'll, we'll talk about that towards the end. We have a whole series on just the hands-on work, trapping and uh, using drop traps and caretaking, that kind of um, kind of ground level stuff, which is so, so much the foundation of TNR. But today we're going to talk about how do you manage TNR on a much uh, larger scale as more of a, a program manager and where you're looking at your entire city or county or town's free roaming cat population and how do you manage that. And your ideal community TNR program is going to have these three components that you see here. And they may not all be there at the same time, especially in the beginning. One is going to be targeting, where you're looking to do very intensive TNR in areas where there are high numbers of cats and the goal is to reduce the cat population quickly, as well as reduce intake from that area and complaints. Then we have return to field, which is the spay and neuter of healthy free roaming cats who um, are unadoptable either for um, space or temperament, or maybe actually they're perfectly fine outside. And they're brought to shelters. And then the shelter makes the decision to spay and neuter them and return them back to where they are. And that reduces euthanasia. It improves the culture in terms of uh, being a life-saving one. And then finally, there's the grassroots mobilization component. And that's where you're trying to get the public involved. You're trying to get them to do hands-on work. And you need to facilitate that. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you do, how do you go about doing that? And, and the goal is to, uh, a couple of things. One is to build awareness of what you're doing and uh, support for it in, in the form of funding or manpower. 
And if it's done properly over time, you will get a gradual population decline in the colonies and areas that are being worked in, not as quickly as if you're targeting. So that's the focus for today is the grassroots stuff. We do have two more in this series, as I mentioned, coming up this year. And here they are. One is, again, about targeted TNR. And that's going to be on May 20th. And then we have a webinar on return to field, which will be on uh, September 16th. So in the course of this series, we'll cover all of the different aspects of this working on a community level. Also, just want to refer you to this book that I wrote and was published by PetSmart Charities. You can download the handout now. It's uh, totally free. Uh, If you do prefer to have a print copy, you can purchase one on Amazon.com. Just just go do a search for my last name, K-O-R-T-I-S, and it will pop up. And um, I think it's selling for about $19 or, or something like that. But this book will go into more depth about each of these aspects of a community TNR programming, including what we're talking about today. So I wanted to start the presentation with talking about neighborhood cats and our experience in New York City. Now, I realize that a lot of today's presentation is going to be sort of urban, suburban biased because that's where you have dense populations of people and where mobilization is um, much, I wouldn't say easier, but much more feasible because you're drawing from a large population base. Now, many of you may be living in more rural areas. So, so some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, you're going to say, I can't do that. You know, I live in surrounded by farmland, but I think a lot of what we talk about can be translated and adapted to a rural setting. It would be interesting to have a webinar someday taught by somebody who has that experience in a rural area. Um, But I do want to acknowledge that today is more based towards more densely, heavily populated areas. So we began Neighborhood Cats formed in 1999. Uh, There were three volunteers, including myself, who lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And basically, it started because we all came upon this colony of cats living in a courtyard, and each of us independently started looking into how can we help these cats, and we kind of found each other. And we were totally self-funded at that point, uh, no formal organization. Back in 1999, there were no spay-neuter programs for feral or community cats in New York City. Some of the clinics would occasionally do some, but there was no TNR program to speak of nothing formal. And the euthanasia rate at city shelters was was quite high at that time. Um, since then, well, we've made, we've made quite a bit of progress. And um, you can see the year 2022 compared to when we started in 2000 has been a really drastic change with you know, intake going from close to 30,000 to under 10,000 and euthanasia going from close to 20,000 to I think it was 810 last year. So really dramatic improvements and not to uh, try to take credit for all of it. uh, it, I think there were three major programs that were going on that uh, made this happen. One was the uh, Maddie's Fund gave New York City a multi-year, multi-million dollar grant that created a transfer program from city shelters into private rescue groups. And that had a huge impact. Also, the ASPCA launched a community-wide spay-neuter program for all cats and dogs. So that was a major factor. But then there was also the grassroots TNR effort that was led by Neighborhood Cats. Uh, In the beginning, it's now spread to a number of organizations. But over the course of 20 years, um, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of free-roaming cats have been made and neutered. And so those factors combined have dramatically changed the situation in the city shelters. So how did we get there? How did we get from A to B? Well, I mentioned that first colony that we found, and there were over 30 cats living in an interior courtyard of one square block. Again, this is on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And what we did was we developed relationships with everybody on the block who had access to the cats. So store owners, superintendents of buildings, doormen, people who lived there, And we learned everything we could about how many there were and who fed them and all the stuff you do when you're doing ground level TNR work. We also found local veterinarians who were willing to fix one or two at a time 
there was one veterinarian who lived right across the street from this particular block, and he he offered his services now and again. And then we would go looking around for veterinarians who had just opened their offices who would give us a good deal. So it, it, it was slow in the beginning. And I, I want to emphasize that because I know, especially in New York City now, but in other areas of the country, there is a spay-neuter shortage, pretty severe in New York right now. But it's, it's another point I'll make again later, which is the limited availability of spay-neuter surgeries is going to impact the pace of progress, but it doesn't have to impact whether there's any progress at all. So even back then when we had nothing, we still plugged along and lo and behold, you know, eventually it turned into something much larger. So this became our model colony. And the goal was to get 100% of the cats spayed and neutered and to place uh, every kitten and friendly adult into a home. We were also doing what I would call, looking back at it, very zealous caretaking. You know, we fed them great food and just watched over them very, probably too closely, but um, we got ourselves kicked out of one or two places because, you know, we were always around. But we really did everything we could to take care of these guys. And then we took, uh, we kept data, uh, we took photos and kept vet records on all the cats. And so without really knowing what we were doing at the time, we were creating a model, a model for what TNR can do. And it was, it was successful. The colonies within a year from uh, mostly due to pulling kittens and getting them homes, the colony size dropped from uh, 30 to 12. Uh, I think an even more impactful thing was that these cats were much less of a nuisance to that area. So on that square block, it being New York City and Manhattan, there were literally thousands of people who were impacted by them, uh, you know, screeching in the middle of the night or making the courtyards difficult to use because they smelled so bad or whatever it might be. So that almost disappeared once all the cats were fixed. And we only had kittens from one female who took several years. Uh, we did finally catch her, but it took a while. But compare that to there were litters constantly before we came along. Cats of the Wild is the podcast for cat lovers who want to make a difference. Listen to inspiring and engaging stories of wild cat conservation and learning how you can help protect cats all over the world. Search for Cats of the Wild in your favorite podcast app now. Do you want to make things easier on yourself and the others in your organization? Our friends at Dubert have teamed up with the Dallas Pets Alive and Spay Neuter Network teams, and together they have created the Companion Case Management Module. It allows you to be more proactive with all your organization's needs, create cases for your clients, and organize them by type. Whether it is a rehoming situation, a pet parent needing food or medical assistance, or simply spay and neuter inquiries, CCM can help you manage all of them right from the Dubert system. Plus, a huge bonus, it allows you to connect with those clients right from the case so there is no need to open up new windows for emails or pull out your phone for text messages. Check it out and learn more at www.dubert.com to get started today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. So what did we learn from this and what can you use uh, now to, you know, what lesson can you draw from this? And let's look at it this way. Let's say we, you're, you're working in an area and there's um, five different colonies of cats and they each have five cats in them, right? And you're running a large-scale TNR program for your, you know, relatively large-scale for your area. And you've got five caretakers that come to you, but you only have five surgery slots available. And this is a really common theme when we're talking about community TNR, which is the demand for your services is always going to way exceed the resources that you have available. So you don't have 25 surgeries, so you can't just fix all of them. You've got five. So what a lot of programs tend to do 
is what I would call the FAIR approach, which is they give each of the caretakers one slot. So it's all FAIR. Everybody gets an equal access. The problem with that approach and what you can see here is you're only attaining a 20% sterilization rate in each one of these colonies. So one cat's fixed, but four are not. And whatever the carrying capacity of each of these colonies is, and that will only be limited by the amount of food that's available, the amount of adequate shelter, whatever the, the limit is on how many cats that particular location can support, they're still going to be there after that one cat is fixed because the other four, if one or two of them are female, are going to continue to breed enough kittens to keep each colony size the same at whatever the cap is. So you'll have been fair, but you won't have achieved any population reduction at all. Plus, you've got four out of five cats that are still going to give rise to complaint calls potentially. So what's a better way to allocate our surgeries? Well, what we learned from our model colony is you're better off just doing one colony and getting it 100% fixed because now you're going to create population or at least your best opportunity for population reduction at the site that you've treated, you'll have almost completely reduced any nuisance complaints and you're going to have population reduction over time, most again, unless there's a lot of immigration, but talk about that. Now, 20% of your problem, instead of 20% of your cats being fixed, also 20% of your problem is fixed. And the next time you get five surgeries, you'll go and do the second one. And if you work your way through the community like this, you'll get the most bang for your buck from your surgeries and the resources you have available. So this is what we call colony level targeting, which is focusing what your resources on a goal that is uh, attainable, which is 100% sterilization. So once we had our model colony, next steps came pretty quickly. So word spread very quickly. And what we found was that every other block had the same problem. At that point in Manhattan, in, on the Upper West Side, the, the stray uh, feral cat population was just completely out of control. And there were cats living in the medians on Broadway, which is an extremely busy street, and in the parks and behind every apartment building. So what we did next was we TNR the colony that was directly across the street. So we were working on uh, the courtyard on 97th Street. So then we went and fixed the 20 cats that were in the courtyards of 98th Street. And we continued to do this approach because, again, we weren't really aware that we were we weren't trying to be strategic. We just lived on the Upper West Side and had jobs besides this. And that's what worked for us was to TNR in our own neighborhood. So we kind of worked our way through. And as we were doing that, one of the things that we did is what I call maximizing caretaker participation. So as much as we could get from the people who wanted our help, we took. So we would try to get help with the trapping, holding the cats, you know, during the project, transport, funding, feeding them, whatever we could do. Part of it was that we needed the help, again, because there were just three of us and a lot of cats, but also we didn't have holding space. Uh, we couldn't take all the time that was needed to do all the work. So we would involve the people who cared about the cats and were feeding them as much as possible. And then we would fill in the gaps. So maybe they couldn't trap. So, you know, that was something we often did because we were developing an expertise at it. Or maybe they didn't have quite enough funding. So we would try to raise enough money to pay the vet bills, things like that. And in the course of this, we decided to incorporate and being a nonprofit allowed us to start doing the kind of basic fundraising that nonprofits do as well as getting small grants. So that just accelerated and allowed us to do more and more. Uh, one good example on the Upper West Side was there were a lot of cats in the park, uh, Riverside Park, which runs for a couple of miles along the Hudson River on the Upper West Side. There were four colonies spread out throughout the park with about 65 cats altogether. And we were able to develop a very strong network of caretakers, the people who were feeding them every day and turn them into trappers. And then we got the New York City Parks Department involved because, as you'll often find, these are long-standing problems, these cat overpopulation situations. 
So they were very receptive to to trying to solve this. And uh, we did get them 100% spayed and neutered. And just, again, this over time, this became quite a success story because 15 years later, there's, there was only one cat left in the park. So basically what we did without quite realizing it was we developed what I call a model neighborhood. So we went from a model colony to a model neighborhood. And after two and a half years of doing this, we had fixed every cat colony that we had heard of on the Upper West Side. And when we went to talk to Animal Control about this, they rang up their data and they found that from the three zip codes we'd been working in, their stray cat intake had dropped by 73%. And that was compared to the rest of the city, which had been rising a small amount, like it had been going up 3%. So the heads of uh, Animal Control at the time were completely sold on the fact that this was a successful approach based on the data that was generated from, from our work. So again, what are the lessons that we learned from this? Well, this is, um, let's call this feral tropolis. And if we're doing colony level targeting, like we talked about at first with our model colony, you're getting 100% of the cats in that group fixed, but you're doing it, you know, whoever calls from whatever neighborhood and you're just going throughout your community without any particular strategy it's going to look like this. You're going to get 100% where you go, but it's going to be scattered throughout. And the problem with this is once you have a TNR colony and the population starts to go down, doesn't necessarily mean the food source is going to go down. It's still potentially a receptive environment for new cats as the population declines. And these colonies are surrounded by unaltered colonies of cats who are reaching the limit of what their environment can support. So a lot of them are going to go out looking for new resources. And if you've got now three cats and enough food, five, they're not going to be that, um, they're not going to try to keep out new cats as vigorously as they might if there was only enough food for the three of them. It's a good reason to teach people to lower the food source as the cats' numbers go down, but that can't always be done. So in this kind of colony level targeting only situation, there's vulnerability to population reduction being reversed by new cats migrating in. So if we don't just do colony level targeting, but we did the, that model neighborhood approach, the same number of surgeries done in this community would look like this. And we would pick one part of our city like we did with the Upper West Side, and we would just focus there. Same number of cats, same number of surgeries, but then you generate those numbers we're talking about. Then you get that dramatic decline in kittens and in intake and complaints and things like that. And now you've um, much more strongly on a community level demonstrated the potential for TNR to solve free roaming cat issues. So success breeds success. And one of the things we learned is that real life examples are much more persuasive than theory. So I'm sure many, if not all of you, are very familiar with, can, can speak fluently on the topic of why TNR is a good idea and why it works and the vacuum effect. But there's nothing as persuasive as, hey, we worked in this neighborhood and there are no kittens there anymore. And there are very few complaints. And here's the testimonials and here's the shelter data. That is going to be much, much more persuasive. You're also going to find that there's other people in the community who are facing the similar issues to what got you involved and they see you have a solution and they want that solution too. So that's what happened to us. We fixed one colony and things were much better. So then the next block wanted it done and then the park wanted it done and so on and so forth. You'll also find that having these empirical success stories is going to attract donors and everybody loves a winner, right? And grantors and things like that. And rightfully so, because you're doing something that's working and it attracts support. It also provides you with the foundation now for expanding it to the wider community. So for us, that meant how do we go from the Upper West Side to all of New York City? And again, I emphasize that as you're doing this, it's very important to document everything you're doing. We kept track of colony numbers. We kept track of what happened to the cats in terms of their outcomes. If you can track you know, more objective data 
or, or I should say more uh, third party data like shelters, especially intake from where you're working. But even if you're a lone rescue group and there is no shelter data, you can still keep track of the requests you receive for assistance. How many are there? Where are they coming from? You can track complaint calls. Dead on arrival is a proxy for free roaming cat populations. Um, rabies exposures is a big, big thing with public health. I know one public health, uh, county public health department started to work with us because they had so many rabies exposures, it was breaking their budget and they needed the number of stray and feral cats in their county to go down. And that made them very open to, to doing TNR. So if you can do TNR and show a reduction in rabies exposures, you're going to get a lot of support from your public health department. So these are all proxies. None of them are a direct relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that the cat population is going down, but taken all together, there's at least interest groups in the community who are benefiting from it. And when you have enough of these data points, it does strongly suggest that the number of cats is going down. Photos, videos are very powerful. You can see this is this is a cat in Riverside Park. So, you know, here we are 21 years later and I'm using the photo, but putting together videos, taking those photos, again, it makes the experience more real or people that you're going to. And it also will help you attract uh, funding. For those of you who are looking for ways to track your data in the matter that we're talking about, we have developed a online database that is called CatStats. And if you go to catstats.org, you can learn more about it. What it is, is it's an online system where caretakers enter their information. Now, you can enter everything yourself as a program if you want to. But what happened in New York City was, uh, again, just we have always been a relatively small nonprofit, so we didn't have time to enter hundreds and then thousands of colonies. So we made it possible for caretakers to enter the information themselves. It doesn't track individual cats, but it tracks colonies, and it maps them, and it lets you know their spay-neuter status and everybody's contact information. Anyway, it's available for uh, $50 a year. We help you set it up and get it going. So if you're interested in that, have a look. So then we got to the point, like I said, we wanted to expand. Um, Word got out, you know, we started getting requests for assistance from all over the city. And obviously we needed more resources than, you know, private vets who would fix one or two cats at a time. So we approached the city shelter, which is now Animal Care Centers of New York City. And they're the ones who looked up the data and saw, you know, the success that we're having. So they were immediately interested in finding ways that they could assist with our effort. We also approached larger animal welfare agencies in the community like ASPCA and Humane Society of New York and other shelters and, and larger rescue groups and showed them, again, that we had this foundation, we had a demonstrable success and that caught a lot of interest. When you're doing this, another thing you can do, in addition to being able to demonstrate that you've uh, that your technique is working, sometimes a good thing to do is to propose pilot projects, so that you know an animal welfare agency isn't having to jump in and do everything all at once, but they can learn how to do it one step at a time. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Wow.